My name is Steve Breyer. I'm a professor in the Urban Education PhD program. You're sitting in our lounge. This is the lounge of the Urban PhD program. Um, and I'm the uh, sort of, I teach public history, public, the history of public education. Um, and uh, I have been working for a number of years on sort of the issues related to the major strike that really transformed this city in the 1960s, the 1968 UFT strike. And in the process of doing that work, I had the good fortune to hook up with Charles Isaacs, who's our featured speaker tonight. And Charlie, back then, as he will tell you, was a young, idealistic, student finishing his first year of law school at the University of Chicago and like a lot of people of our generation, men in particular, concerned about the war in Vietnam and the draft and decided he was interested in getting um, a teaching job because that gave you a draft deferment. Um, uh, and got recruited out of law school to teach in this new community control school district in central Brooklyn and Ocean Hill, Brownsville. So, He's someone who has both lived the history and now, um, thankfully, has had the opportunity to write the history. He's just written a memoir, um, which uh, several of us are trying to help him get published, um, which will talk about some of the really um, extraordinarily important changes that happened in the New York City public schools in the midst of this struggle. And uh, he'll talk to you about his own personal experience and the history of that event, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions. We'll do a couple of hours. We'll try to end around 8.30. So without further ado, Charles Isaacs. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Professor Breyer for inviting me tonight, tonight and thank all of you for being interested enough to be here. Um, by the way, I never did get the draft deferment, but that's another story. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about tonight, I want to give you a flavor of what it was like being in junior high school 271, the eye of the storm, during the great UFT strike. I need to set the stage <clears throat> why all this was happening. I'm going to do it very quickly. Um, we could take questions later. So it started in 1966, absolute failure of the integration movement, which had been burning for 12 years. Cry went up for community control. If our schools are going to be segregated, <coughs> we should be able to run them. The Board of Education certainly couldn't do it. And that demand spread like wildfire, not only through New York City, but to other cities as well. Really, in order to uh, contain it, the Board of Education designated three small districts for an experiment in sometimes, actually they called it decentralization. So the people in those communities, they heard community control. Ocean Hill Brownsville was a very organized district. It had the Brownsville Community Council, which had been going for several years and had a hundred organizations belonged to it. <clears throat> so that planning council wasn't going to wait for the Board of Education to get around to submitting proposals and committees and commissions and uh, when everybody's old and gray, maybe we'll try something. They right away <clears throat> held an election for a governing board that would run the schools. They went to the Board of Education and said, we need a list of the parents because we want the parents to vote in this election. <clears throat> and they said, uh, well, there are only two secretaries who can give you that information. OK, where do we find them? Well, they're on vacation. So the Planning Council organized its own door-to-door -door registration and election process. They <clears throat> elected a governing board with a very good turnout. The governing board elected its chairman, local pastor, Reverend C. Herbert Oliver. <clears throat> they replaced the principals who, who left as soon as they heard that there was going to be something doing with community control. And they hired a unit administrator like a district superintendent, Rody McCoy. And they opened the school year um, ready, ready to roll. 
UFT, the Uni United Federation of Teachers, went on strike that fall. Not over this, but over other issues, the chief one being the right of a, any teacher to expel any child he or she deemed disruptive. This was the first strike that the parents, black parents, Puerto Rican parents, didn't support the teachers. And it was a very bad way to start. Another problem was <clears throat> they replaced these principals, they got a unit administrator they trusted, but they had the same old teachers, many of whom, maybe most of whom, were hostile to the idea of community control. So in addition to the normal incompetence, the governing board also had to do with outright sabotage, and things did not go well. Finally, in early May, they transferred out 13 teachers and six supervisors. <clears throat> Albert Shanker, the president of the UFT, called foul. <clears throat> they said these teachers' due process rights were being violated, even though teachers were being transferred between districts all the time. Nobody was getting fired. The governing board wouldn't move because they felt that if they didn't do something now, their constituency would blame them for the failure of the schools, and that would be the end of community control. Shanker's response, call on all the teachers in the district to walk out, and 350 out of the 500 did for the, for the last six weeks of that term. Community board said, hey, why don't you stay out? We'll hire replacements. And they did during that summer of 68. I was one of those. People came from all over the country, some attracted by the possibility of a draft deferment, many attracted by the political atmosphere that was developing there and the possibility to really teach in an urban school setting. <clears throat> so the United Federation of Teachers in reaction to what this governing board did in this little district of eight schools involving 350 teachers went on strike citywide. So here you are, opening day, Monday, September 9th, 1968. The UFT was on strike and virtually all the city's schools were closed. In Ocean Hill, Brownsville, they were open, but far from normal. Here's the scene in front of Junior High School 271. Hundreds of cops, noisy UFT pickets, dozens of reporters and photographers, bulky TV cameras on men's shoulders bobbing and weaving through the throng, children and parents trying to make their way through it all, teachers and community people trying to help. In other words, it was chaos. Creating order inside the school wouldn't be easy. <clears throat> 62 of our teachers, more than half of our faculty at full strength, and it was never at full strength, were new to the school, new to the district. Of the 62, 43, including me, would be facing a classroom for the very first time, and there were still 11 vacancies. Many of the UFT teachers who walked out during the previous term so classroom keys and roll books with them and left a total mess of the children's records. We had 1,735 children, 90% black, 10% Puerto Rican, <clears throat> who somehow were assigned to homerooms where they would spend the morning. Hopefully regular classes could begin in the afternoon. <clears throat> the eighth grade went to the auditorium first for an orientation session. I didn't have a homeroom assignment, so I went in to watch. I'm pretty sure this was the first eighth grade orientation session of its kind. At Stage Center was acting assistant principal Al Van, who was also the president of the African American Teachers Association. <clears throat> Flanking him on both sides stood a dozen black teachers dressed in dashikis and other African-inspired garments. It was very colorful. 
A Marine Corps veteran, Van projected a natural air of authority. He had no trouble getting the student's attention. I took notes on some of his remarks. <clears throat> we are engaged in a fight for survival, he began. The survival of the black race, of our race, of our people. We must make it as a race. And we cannot survive in this country without some very necessary skills. All kinds of skills so we can get good jobs to help serve our people. We need the skills we can learn right here at 271. Math, science, reading, typing, languages. To survive and to prosper as a race of people, we need all these skills. Now, to get these skills for survival, you must respect and listen to your teachers, all your teachers, be they black or white. However, if they don't respect you, if we find that they can't do the job, there will be some changes made. Now remember, give your teachers, and many of them are new, give them a chance. If you do find yourself in a dispute with a te your teacher and you're in the right, we'll defend you. You can depend on that. And when he closed, he asked how many students listen to the radio station WWRL. Most hands went up, and he gave them a full-throated cue. Then say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud, thundered the response. It's a new tone for a new type of ghetto school. <clears throat> My first assignment was to run upstairs to cover a sixth grade class. The teacher was missing. My job was to have the kids fill out the blue index cards issued by the Board of Ed with their name, home address, emergency contact, all that kind of thing. Here was where my education began. While they were working on these cards, I opened the middle drawer of the teacher's desk and found a notebook. <clears throat> I opened it up, and on each page, there was a very beautifully written, as only teachers write, lesson plan in Board of Education format, which I don't remember. It's goal, objective, method, something like that. I was very nice. When one day, second day, third day, kept on going. But here's the thing. The pages were yellow. How long does it take for notebook pages to turn yellow? It seemed to me that whatever teacher left this lesson plan book behind in the previous spring had been doing the same thing year after year since the Truman administration. <laughs> My next revelation was I walked around the room to see how the kids were doing and found that after six or seven years of public school, half of them couldn't write their names. They were illiterate and semi-literate. Was I glad to see the teacher come back? And it, I left the room, I was a little dazed. Now these two discoveries, the lesson plan book and the illiteracy of the students, probably weren't directly linked, but they would always be linked in my mind, and they still are. My next assignment was to <coughs> relieve an eighth grade teacher who was due for a lunch break. This time, it, I would be there longer. I didn't know how long, and I realized I had no idea what I was going to do when I got there. I guess I expected somebody was going to tell me, hand me a book or something. So as I'm climbing the stairs, trying to come up with a plan, I'm a little nervous. I got there, again, an astounding sight. I opened the door of the classroom, and there were the kids. They're playing tic-tac-toe. They're passing notes around, tossing notes around, talking to each other doing everything except listening to the teacher. The teacher <clears throat> is at the front of the room, trying to speak above the din. Are we in trouble? No, uh, he showed some instructions. Oh, okay. <laughs> you immediately... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so the teacher's trying to speak above the din, trying to convince them that they need to address him as Dr. Fruitbein. <laughs> I look on the board, Daniel Fruitbein, J. 
JD. He had a law degree. Now, he had been with these kids for two hours, and he's still trying to introduce himself. It wasn't going well. Well, he couldn't, he couldn't wait to get out of there. So the class quieted down for the transition. I found there was always a window of opportunity, sometimes very short. It's like, let's see what you got. Well, good morning, reasonably polite response. I told them my name and wrote it on the board. And then I turned back to them and said, people call me Charlie, and you can too. This startled everyone in the room, including me. It was a totally spontaneous reaction to the pomposity of this other guy. Eventually, this would bring me some notoriety because word of it did get around the city. And that morning, reactions were mixed. Some of the kids seemed to like the idea. Some were mulling it over. A few objected. Their parents had told them to address their teacher as Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. I said that would be fine if it made them comfortable. So I started off with three names, Mr. Isaacs, Charlie, and guess what? Mr. Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it did get their attention, so I started right in. How many people don't like math? Most hands up. How many people think math is a hard subject? Every hand was up. So I smiled and clapped my hands, OK, with great apparent conviction. Now I'm going to show you how easy and how much fun math really is. This man is crazy, out of his head. But they were still curious and willing to give me a chance. Somebody tell me what the speedometer on a car is. I knew it. This ain't math. How many miles, someone called out. I mean, if I travel 10 miles, the speedometer will say 10. If I go 100, it'll say 100. No, not that. It says how fast you'd be going. And on we went. We developed a chart on the board, 60 miles an hour, and under it, two columns. One, two, three, hours, and miles, 60, 120, 180. And we quickly explored the relationships between these two columns. And made the chart a little bigger. So after about 20 minutes of Mr. Charlie's Socratic method, the class discovered the key to the code, rate times time equals distance. Now some still protested that this wasn't math. <clears throat> I had no idea how much more time I'd have with them, but I knew we were on a roll. So I used the same method to introduce a few, few short, discrete, abstract topics. Uh, zero, infinity, negative numbers. After about an hour and a half, the Dr. Fruitbein returned, bursting with one critical question. Were they quiet? <laughs> no, they certainly weren't. Down in the lunchroom, I was introduced to Steve Mayer, a social studies teacher who taught eight years in another district and had been its UFT chapter chairman. When the UFT turned against community control, he resigned from the union and transferred to 271. He invited me to sit in on his next class. The centerpiece of the class <clears throat> was a discussion of Langston Hughes' 1940 poem called Ballad of a Landlord. Here's how it went. <clears throat> landlord, landlord, my roof has sprung a leak. Don't you remember I told you about it way last week? Landlord, landlord, these steps is broken down. Don't you? When you come up yourself, it's a wonder you don't fall down. Ten bucks, you say I owe you? Ten bucks, you say, is due? Well, that's ten bucks more, and I'll pay you till you fix this house up new. What? You're going to get eviction orders? You're going to cut off my heat? You're going to take my furniture and throw it in the street? Uh-huh. You talking high and mighty. Talk on till you get through. You ain't going to be able to say a word if I land my fist on you. Police, police, come and get this man. He's trying to ruin the government and overturn the land. Copper's whistle, patrol bell, arrest. Precinct station, iron cell, headlines in press. Man threatens landlord. 
Ten and held, no bail. Judge gives Negro 90 days in county jail. Mayer did a masterful job taking the class through the poem, verse by verse, asking a series of questions, and eventually the students linked it to things they had seen or experienced themselves. Spirited debate ensued over who should have done what when. That landlord should be shot. I would have done the same thing the tenant did. He shouldn't have gone to jail. I saw the same thing happen on my block last year. He shouldn't have shut off the heat. There's children in those houses and old people. I don't know. He might have waited a while longer. Yeah, but he was going to get evicted. He was a slumlord, and he deserved it. Mayer's plan was to use the poem as a springboard to further discussion of inner city housing and eventually other urban issues, like the role of the police. It looked to me like he knew exactly how to go about doing this. A few years earlier, a young teacher introduced this poem in a Boston ghetto school. That got him fired. I knew that wasn't going to happen at 271. The teacher's name, by the way, was Jonathan Kozol, who you may have heard of. <clears throat> As time went by, I thought a lot about this poem and its themes. Institutional racism and dysfunction, tone deafness, military solutions to social problems, blaming the victim. To me, it became a metaphor for the New York City school system. After school, we had a meeting of the math department. <clears throat> it was run by two old guard assistant principals who had been supplied by the Board of Education, not by the governing board. <clears throat> I had been a math major, but nearly all the other teachers were licensed in other subjects. And some of them were justifiably apprehensive about teaching a subject they didn't know. The advice they got, don't worry, you probably know more than the kids do. Just drill, drill, drill. You have to pound it into their heads or they won't learn. The contradictions between the old and the new were already apparent. Of our five certified assistant principals, there was one, a very popular middle-aged Italian-American who enthusiastically supported community control. I met him after the department meeting. We talked for a while, and I asked him, What's the, what do you think is the most important innovation <clears throat> that this school represents? He answered immediately. For the first time, he said, black kids have an opportunity to identify with black leadership in their school. By the end of that first day, which was quite a day, I had made up my mind about what kind of teacher I was and was not going to be. <coughs> Excuse me. I had also experienced many of the contradictory elements that would define the entire year. The next day, I got my regular assignment, teaching math to four eighth grade classes. There would be no drilling, no pounding of stuff into young heads. My challenge was to make math as interesting and as fun as I could. And I meant to teach mathematics, not computing. Mathematics has to do with thinking and creative problem solving, not moving numbers around. <clears throat> so I began each of the four classes if they'd like to see a magic trick. Everyone likes magic, and they seemed to relieved to see that we wouldn't be doing math. I told them to write down two secret numbers. The first one between 1 and 9, and the second between 10 and 99. Not to tell me what they are. Then I announced that I could tell them what those numbers were. But first, they had to humor me and work with the numbers a little bit. So I told them, multiply your first number by 2. Then add 5. Then multiply by 5. Through eighth grade classes, they could do this. Stick a 0 on the end. Add your second secret number. Subtract the number of this room, which was 237. Give him a few minutes. OK, what'd you get? Boy gave me his result, and I told him what his secret numbers were. 
And all around the class, we did this one by one. They told me the result they got, and I told them the secret numbers. By halfway through, they were demanding to know, how'd you get it? <laughs> that was my opening for a stealth lesson on place values and some basic algebra. By the time they realized they were doing math, it was too late to tune out. <laughs> From there on, I always came to class with some general idea of what I wanted to do, and then played off the interaction <clears throat> with and among the kids. I never, in the time I was at Ocean Hill Brownsville, wrote a single lesson plan. I just kept thinking of that notebook that I found on the first day. Eventually, I developed a general theory about teaching math, to which I will not subject you, <laughs> unless asked. During the first 10 weeks of school, the UFT carried out three citywide strikes. But it was really one long strike, with two very brief and, in Ocean Hill, very disruptive interruptions, each one followed by resumption of the strike with escalating UFT demands. The first strike lasted only two days. The settlement required the, by the way, I should say, none of these settlements were agreed to by the governing board in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. They were ignored in the negotiations. <clears throat> so the first settlement required the re-imposition of the 210 dismissed teachers who wanted to return, which included 17 at 271. In the middle of the next day, the nine who showed up headed towards the entrance. Picture the police presence that day. 3,000 helmeted officers, 35 on horseback, 150 plainclothesmen, three communication units, a mobile command center, helicopters hovering overhead, and sharpshooters stationed on the roof of nearby houses. <clears throat> Blocking the steps to the front entrance were about 100 parents and community activists. A wedge of police in riot gear charged into them, clearing a path for the nine teachers following behind. Paddy wagons pulled up to the curb. Does anybody not know what paddy wagons were? OK, good. I was teaching a class on the second floor facing the front when the commotion prompted some of us to glance out the window. From my left, I heard, hey, that's my mother. The entire class flocked to the windows. We saw parents and grandparents, including one very pregnant woman, <clears throat> being dragged into the paddy wagons. Others who were trying to interfere were beaten back with nightsticks. That was the end of that math class, but we were all getting an education. It was a short, bloody skirmish with many casualties. It ended <clears throat> when a troop of Black Panthers arrived and lined up on the opposite sidewalk. They didn't do anything but stand there in formation silently. But the violence came to an end. The nine UFTers spent the rest of the day sitting in a locked office guarded by police. But despite the armed protection, Shanker claimed that their lives had been threatened, and he called the second citywide strike. This one would last over two weeks. During that time, we elected a faculty steering committee. Its structure came out of a heated debate over the meaning of democracy in this place and time. At first, it was assumed that we would simply have nominations and elect the members by majority vote. Many black teachers ex objected to this, though. They comprised only a third of the faculty, but insisted on equal representation. I decided to sit back and listen, keep my mouth shut. Strongest argument for this position was presented by Les Campbell, an, uh, an ATA leader, African American Teachers Association, and head of our African American History Department. Of course, we know him since then as G2 Wayusi. Campbell cut an imposing figure. He was about the size of LeBron James. He could speak in a booming voice. He wore colorful dashikis and African accessories. And he wasn't shy about describing himself as a revolutionary black nationalist. 
It could also cut to the heart of an argument. He presented the issue in an international anti-colonial context. If the white majority of this faculty decides who will re represent the black teachers in the struggle, in the midst of this struggle for community control and self-determination, then he said 271 will be taking a huge step backward in the fight for social justice. In the end, that view, which had not previously occurred to me or most of the other white teachers, prevailed. We agreed that a black caucus would elect three delegates, and the rest of us would elect the other three. I was one of those elected from the caucus of others. Over time, it became obvious that this had been a critical decision. Not only was it the only way the steering committee would be able to function effectively, to steer anything at all. It also began the process that forged 271, contrary to everything that's been written about it, into a model of interracial cooperation and trust. I was learning. <clears throat> On September 30th, after the second set settlement, the UFT teachers were back. Now there were only 83 who wanted back in, but still the 17 at 271. All the others had transferred elsewhere. That day, <clears throat> the district had 850 police, nearly all of them at 271, plus 38 observers from the central board's professional staff, five from the board itself, and 16 from the UFT. The police set up barricades at both ends of the block, presumably to prevent another confrontation on the front steps. But even parents were kept from taking their children past the barricades. Some just took them back home. Later, they explained, they wouldn't let their kids into an armed camp all by themselves. Once the 17 UFT teachers got into the building with police escort, they spent the day, to put it mildly, being generally obnoxious. One teacher clocked in then left his class unattended for two hours, for example, claiming that he couldn't find a pencil. They made little effort to actually teach. Fred Nauman, their chapter chairman, spent his day outside the classroom compiling a list of 65 union grievances that he would file. <clears throat> they did their best to provoke us, to get the school shut down. We did our best to avoid them. But they couldn't be avoided, and the students were growing rebellious. None of those teachers were able to control their classes. <clears throat> I was in the middle of a lesson when one of them threw the door open, walked into the room, and began picking up papers from the middle of the floor. He and I got into a very heated verbal exchange. I had to persuade a couple of big eighth graders to stay in their seats. Finally, I held the door open and started, started counting backwards from 10. Once I got to zero, I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> Finally, <clears throat> at about two, he belts, flipped me the finger, and walked out. I slammed the door beside him. The class applauded. We spent the remaining minutes <clears throat> before the bell talking about what was going on. It was this student here, I remember clearly, with the same pained expression on his face that he had doing math, who asked, why did they have to come back? Everything was going so good. It was heartbreaking. <clears throat> Our steering committee met and issued a statement addressed to the 17. It read in part, we don't want the police who must escort you into the schools. We don't want the so-called impartial observers. We do not want the union, and we do not want you. At a community rally that packed the auditorium that night, the 50 black and white teachers who attended were met with a rousing reception. 
One speaker asked rhetorically, when have you ever seen teachers at a community meeting? The teacher who read our statement got the longest standing ovation of the evening. But we hadn't solved anything. Early the next morning, our steering committee met. We decided to shut the school down ourselves rather than let the UFT destroy it. <clears throat> we designated a teacher who was about five feet tall and maybe 100 pounds, <clears throat> a woman, a white woman, to read our statement over the PA system and announce the walkout. <clears throat> we waited a few minutes, went out the front entrance, and started down the block. The building emptied. Most of the teachers and many of the older students followed. Now we had a march. As we went through the community <clears throat> with reporters trying to keep up and trying to find out what was going on, which we didn't really know, people came off the sidewalks and out of their homes to join us. And we eventually grew to well over 500 people. Parents, teachers, community citizens, and children. We shut down three more schools that day and ended up being attacked by a small army of police. During the next few days, Rhody McCoy had the UFT group assigned to phantom classes with students registered who had previously moved away or who were chronically truant. The superintendent of schools, Bernie Donovan, then suspended the governing board and ordered McCoy to give them real class assignments. McCoy said, I only take orders from the governing board. Donovan suspended him, called the principals. The principals said, we only take orders from McCoy. Donovan suspended all of them. He appointed one of the old guard assistant principals, Evelyn Farrar, as acting principal. The next morning, we decided <clears throat> we would follow Al Van's leadership instead. Farrar, who was clearly overwhelmed, announced over the PA system that she was closing, closing the school for the day. Van took the microphone and announced that it was staying open, which it did. At midday, a bunch of us confronted the UFT-17 in the teacher's lounge, where they were playing cards with police protection, of course. There was a lot of yelling. Coincidentally, a group of angry parents stormed into the principal's office <clears throat> to yell about the suspensions. By the end of the day, before the bell, the UFT-17 were out the door, and all four of the old guard assistant principals requested transfers, which Donovan immediately granted, and we applauded. That night, there was another rally to protest the suspensions. McCoy gave her angry, defiant speech where he said, Donovan will have to carry me out of here. It was followed by a five-minute standing ovation. On the late TV news that night, Donovan announced that he was closing 271 indefinitely. That sparked a flurry of phone calls among the teachers. <clears throat> We knew that many children would be coming to school anyway. They might not even know that it was closed. And we didn't want to leave them alone with the police. So we decided to go to the school in the morning. I arrived early. I can't give you a first-hand account of what happened that day, because by the time most people arrived, I was already on my way downtown, handcuffed to a bench in a paddy wagon. The Evening Post and the Daily News reported this <clears throat> in their late editions and were thoughtful enough to include my home address. That's what they did in those days. That was when the hate mail started. Here's one. Hi, Pinhead. <laughs> you commie bastard. <laughs> so you think you can cause trouble wherever you go. I hope the police crease that hard skull of yours, <laughs> nigger lover lout. Why does a gutter snipe like you appear 
where you are not wanted, you dirty SOB. <clears throat> like that. I don't know if you can see it, but it's very neat handwriting. <laughs> Red pencil. Could, it, it could only have come from the teacher. <laughs> Over the weekend, <clears throat> McCoy promised that he would give the, these teachers real classes if Donovan would reopen the school and rescind the suspensions. <clears throat> and Donovan said he would. So Shanker announced that the UFT was closing all the schools once again. The third citywide strike. One that he said wouldn't end until both McCoy and the governing board were removed and the Ocean Hill-Brownsville demonstration district entirely dissolved. <clears throat> the third strike was the longest and the ugliest. Throughout, 271 was under siege. As soon as the strike began, the, <clears throat> if the front page of the normally staid New York Times screamed, death threat cited at 271. That was over what had happened in the teacher's lounge. There were two large city hall rallies this, that week. On Tuesday, in a hastily called demonstration, we gathered with about 20,000 supporters of community control who came from all over the city. At 5.30, in the middle of the rush hour, somehow a decision was made to take over the Brooklyn Bridge. We were going to march over the bridge to downtown Brooklyn, where the Board of Education headquarters was located at 110 Livingston Street. So we all turned and started over the bridge. Not the walkways, the bridge. I didn't look behind, but this was rush hour. I don't think we made too many friends down there that day. Well, there were police on the bridge, but they couldn't stop us. They just drew back. We got over to the Brooklyn side of the bridge. There were dozens of squad cars with the lights flashing. We didn't know what to expect. Well, somebody had made the decision that the path of least resistance was to give us a police escort to 110 Livingston Street. And there we went and we held another rally. When that was over, everybody was pumped up and we walked four miles through Bedford-Stuyvesant back to 271 and had another rally. It all ended about midnight. The UFT, meanwhile, was mobilizing <clears throat> for its own rally at City Hall on Thursday. Here's one of their leaflets that they distributed to get people to the march. I'll read a little of it. <clears throat> Why weren't your schools open today? One, some teachers were threatened with death if they remained at 271. No. Union teachers and supervisors were cursed and spat upon. No. This is Evelyn Farrar, acting principal of 271, has under pressure of physical harm transferred out of Ocean Hill, Brownsville. No, but she was probably having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Here's the best one. McCoy's teachers are teaching the three R's of racism, rioting, and revolution. <laughs> the intimidation, physical violence, rioting, illegal appointments, and transfers have been going on in many parts of the city for the past several years. We must stop it now in Ocean Hill, Brownsville to prevent it from, from spreading. And then it urged people to go to the rally at City Hall on Thursday. And it was a big one. The ranks were swelled by members of other all-white unions, like the construction trades. The New York City teaching staff, by the way, at that time, was 93% white. The student body was majority black and Puerto Rican. There were <clears throat> four black principals before Ocean Hill Brownsville, no Puerto Ricans. The four black principals were all in elementary schools. Our 
uh, principal was the first black principal of a secondary school. And <clears throat> at one of the elementary schools, we had the first Puerto Rican principal. This is kind of a paradox. The community control demonstrations, <clears throat> which featured all kinds of signs, many of them supporting self-determination for people of color, were multiracial and integrated. The UFT rallies, <clears throat> which declared themselves um, supporting civil rights for teachers, were 99.99% white. That week, the New York Civil Liberties Union <clears throat> put out a report. They had investigated this conflict. It was called The Burden of Blame. Here's one of their conclusions. The UFT has used due process as a smokescreen to obscure its real goal, which is to de discredit decentralization and sabotage community control. The major burden of blame for the chaos in Ocean Hill Brownsville must fall on the Central Board of Education and, lamentably, the United Federation of Teachers. Shanker's support was starting to crack and he needed to shift the terms of debate. <clears throat> His main excuse for the strikes, the violation of due process rights, had been blown away by the city's chief defender of due process. In what turned out to be a, a, brilliant, a brilliantly cynical strategic move, the UFT created a campaign of fear, claiming for itself the last line of defense against a mounting threat of black anti-Semitism. In an October 20th speech to an all-white audience in Houston, Shanker claimed that New York City teachers were threatened with death if they didn't lose their jobs, and that throughout the nation, schools were in danger of being taken over by black militants. If, quote, black separatists were able to take over the New York City schools, he warned, quote, how long will it be before it happens in Philadelphia, in Chicago, Detroit, Washington, and Los Angeles? As the storm raged week after week, exacerbating tensions and fraying nerves throughout New York City, as Ocean Hill Brownsville found itself under an intensifying state of siege, an inverse phenomenon evolved inside 271, the focus of all the commotion. While the city was tearing itself apart, we were thriving. We were literally in the calm eye of the raging storm. The pressure cooker atmosphere created a sense of unity among the staff, now freed of saboteur teachers and old school administrators. Along with the fierce determination to make this experiment work. Among the students, the shared experience of crossing picket lines with their teachers of enduring with us the verbal abuse of the white union pickets, as well as occasional physical harassment by the police, helped create a sense of solidarity inside the walls of the school. The parents welcomed the spirit and dedication of the new teaching staff and were more than willing to participate in making the project a success. 271 became a haven where parents, community volunteers, students and teachers joined forces and worked together. During this time, the typical ghetto school dynamic, pitting students, teachers, and parents against each other in an adversarial triangle of blame was absent. With police on the streets and the rooftops, with UFT pickets marching and shouting in front of the school, with press reports distorting our own lived experiences, the dynamic now was all of us together against what seemed like the entire outside world. One Saturday, somebody arranged free buses. I never knew how. We took 600 kids up to Bear Mountain for a day of play. Didn't have a single problem. One of my students made a pin for me in metal shop, the colors of the Black Liberation flag. Another one gave me a poem she wrote. It's short. Police Go Away by Kathy, Class 8211. 
When I go to sleep, I pray, police, please, go away. We don't need you. You know you're blue. You sway your sticks. You play your tricks. You're in our schools. You're playing us for fools. Stay away, stay away. You're only in the way. For you are there night and day. When will you go away? Leave us in peace, at least. Go away, police. Let me sleep in peace. The doors of our school were once again open to everyone. Parents visited regularly and were invited into the classroom by their children's teachers. Project Method, a group of young Ocean Hill activists, seemed to be everywhere, helping in every way they could. Sometimes Black Panthers came in to help patrol the hallways. In direct contradiction of press reports, the Ocean Hill-Brownsville community was becoming more, not less, tolerant of white teachers in its schools. Parents recognized the work that the new teachers were doing, as along with our acceptance of accountability to their elected Black and Puerto Rican governing board. Any journalist who took the trouble to notice, though few did, would have seen at that time a rare example, at any time, of interracial cooperation on a principled, mutually respectful basis. One of the most observed classes was that of Les Campbell. <clears throat> Sometimes there were more observers than there were students. But none of those observations ever made their way into the daily press. He invited me to sit in whenever I wanted to, and I did several times. I wish I could have done more because I was learning something. It was the best decorated room in the school with, with <clears throat> maps of Africa and pictures of uh, African-American African leaders, most notably Malcolm X. One class that I enjoyed, he had a map in the front and asked, where are Italian-Americans from? Italy. Where are Irish-Americans from? Ireland. Where are Polish-Americans from? Poland. Can anybody find Negro land on this map? The kids cracked up because they knew where he was going. But then he explained the origin of the word and where it fit into the theft of their history. It was a great class. We had other African-American history teachers. One of them, Alan Kellogg, was one of the few genuine scholars to teach in the New York City schools. He had studied at the University of Ghana and the University of Cairo. And he was well on his way to a PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He put his path to professorship on hold while he came to Ocean Hill Brownsville. And at the time, he was inclined to forget all the rest and stay there. He was very popular. He was also white. As late as the 1950s, New York City textbooks instructed children, can't make this stuff up, but they did, that slaves were happy and well cared for, that emancipation was responsible for all kinds of civic disorder, and that niggers were drunks, thieves, and liars. Our students were learning something different, that they had a place in the world and were connected to a proud historical narrative. We were encouraged to experiment with new techniques and materials. Also encouraged was, encouraged was openness and flexibility in the classrooms. Teachers took an active interest in the students' families and home lives. I met as many parents as I could. And the interest went both ways. When a student at the beginning of one class asked what my salary was, I jumped on a chance to turn that curiosity into a math lesson. Shelving the work I had planned, I asked, asked whether he meant gross pay or take-home pay. <laughs> huh? This led to a practical lesson on what taxes and social security were and a stealth lesson in percentages. That opportunity only arose because they felt free enough at the start of the class to ask about my salary and because I wasn't constrained by lockstep curricular requirements and lesson plans. And don't get me started about standardized tests. I.F. Stone legendary investigative reporter since the Truman administration, visited our school on October 25th. This is what he wrote in his newsletter. 
<clears throat> to visit the black controlled schools which have stirred such forebodings on both sides of the controversy is like waking from a nightmare. He describes his visit to the school. The atmosphere was incredibly different from what I had been led to expect. I found black and white teachers, Jewish and Gentile, working together not just peacefully but with zest and comradeship. The classes were orderly. There was none of that screaming by teacher or against pupil and among the children, which is common in most New York City schools. I felt it would be a tragedy if this experiment in community control were shut down. But observances like these did not seem to be newsworthy. A veteran New York Post reporter wrote, not in the Post, but in the Nation, I began to get an inkling of how poorly we were performing when I spoke to some of my colleagues in Manhattan. <clears throat> Most had gotten the impression that Ocean Hill was a wasteland filled with angry warriors waiting for the signal to attack. Most believed that the schools were populated by angry children, defiant and ready to slit the throat of the nearest white man. In Ocean Hill, Brownsville, we were teaching and relating to children and parents as though the change had already come. The forces of inertia and reaction, the anger and finger pointing were outside, not inside our schools. Many of us were, in our most selfish private thoughts, not really anxious for the strike to end, even though we were opposing it with everything we had. We knew that we would have, ab have absolutely no influence <clears throat> over any potential settlement and that the governing board would have little part to play in it either. Our educational sanctuary existed only within the school's four walls. Before penetrating those walls, both staff and students first had to get past raucous UFT picket lines and their massive police protection. There was an incident between, one, between me and one of those lines that put my picture in the Daily News centerfold spread. This triggered another round of hate mail. It was a little spooky when I found this one slipped under my apartment door. Dear Scab, saw your picture in the paper. Hope you can live with yourself. I was already getting used to the hate mail and this wasn't the worst of it, but this one had to be from someone in my own building. One night I was invited for dinner by an education teacher at LIU named Elaine Waldman. She was a maverick and she was very frustrated. Her analysis was that the students were being taught by people who couldn't teach in a ghetto school themselves, and that what the students were learning was not how to be an effective teacher, but how to excuse failure. And she had an idea, which was the reason for the invitation. She suggested that I bring one of my classes down to meet with her classes. Maybe they could have a dialogue. Maybe somebody could learn something. So I said I'd bring the idea back to 271 and get back to him. So I brought the proposal to my sharpest eighth grade class. <clears throat> I was a little surprised because I hadn't thought about this. Most of the students didn't know what college was except sponsors of basketball teams. And there was some resistance. They felt that you know, they were going to be put under a microscope. But I presented it as role reverse, so I said, you'll be teaching the teachers. And they said, okay. So a couple of weeks later, <clears throat> they chose a panel of five. They were faced, and, and it was agreed that any, any of the other students could talk whenever they wanted. They're facing 75 white LIU education students. Here's some of the remarkable dialogue that I was able to record. <clears throat> Isn't there really a lot of bad feeling between blacks and whites at 271? No. The black people in the school get along fine with most of the whites. The only people who we don't get along with are the Negroes. What will you do if the UF teachers come back? Suppose you're in one of their classes. 
Well, I just wouldn't do what they say. If the teacher says to copy something on the board, I just wouldn't do it. But he would still be your teacher, shouldn't you do as he says? He wouldn't be my teacher. I just might have to sit in his classroom for a while. After walking out on us like they did, we're not going to let them strut back in and start ordering us around again, like nothing happened in between. Don't you think the UFT teachers have a reason to be on strike? Have you ever asked them about the cause they're fighting for? Have you ever tried to find out something about the other side? I don't know why they think they walked out. I ask the UFT pickets all the time why they're walking around in circles in the rain and in the cold, and they never answer me. As far as I'm concerned, they're on strike because they're against me, because I'm a kid, and because I'm black. We've read reports that children are running wild in the schools and terrorizing the staff. How does school discipline compare with earlier years? Before, the kids used to act bad because they didn't respect the teachers. Nothing was being taught, and the kids didn't see any reason to sit still and be bored. Another one. Right, now things are different. We have mostly good teachers, so we do what we're supposed to do. Sure, we kid around with Charlie sometimes, but when he says we should do math, we do it. We're more relaxed, but we learn more, too. At a student's mention of the teacher's first name, mouths dropped open. Whispers of approval buzzed around the room. Charlie, who do those kids think they are? After the initial shock, one person asked, do you call all your teachers by their first names? No, just him. Oh. After an hour and a half, the session broke up with the college students enthusiastically applauding their eighth grade instructors. I happily joined in. I couldn't have been more proud. This was one of the high points of the year for me. Came as no surprise a couple of years later when I heard that our host, Elaine Waldman, had been fired. At one point during the morning, the students brought up some complaints about a few of their teachers. One wrote too more, much on the chalkboard, another talked too much, another was too strict. I knew these teachers. I felt that most of them were trying to do a good job and might not know of their students' gripes. On the subway back home, I asked why they didn't just tell the teachers what their complaints were. If they had complaints about me, I'd certainly want to know about them. The children, so outgoing and articulate outside of school, were too inhibited to confront their own teachers with their, with their grievances. I decided to help them find a way to get their message across. <clears throat> Two days later, following a brief discussion, the class chose a committee to pre prepare an evaluation form that they would use to rate their teachers. The committee drafted 15 questions according to criteria they themselves selected. Following questions, debates, and amendments, and a little lesson in democratic procedure, the questionnaire was finalized. It was agreed that they would complete the surveys anonymously. All I did was add it strictly for grammar and then type it up and make copies. <clears throat> Here is, to my knowledge, the first teacher evaluation form developed entirely by students in any New York City school or maybe any United States school. Do you feel you are learning? Does the teacher keep you interested? Does the teacher talk too much? Is he too strict? Does the teacher let the students be active in class discussions? Too much or too little homework? Is the teacher a dictator? How is the teacher's personality? Excellent, good, fair, unsatisfactory. Does the teacher seem interested in the subject? Is the homework interesting to do? Do you think these were good questions? Why or why not? Once the survey results were in, I showed the class how to tabulate them, a lesson in basic percentages and statistics. We prepared two copies of the, of the statistical results for each teacher being evaluated, one for the teacher and one they insisted for the principal. Teacher reactions were mi mixed. Some were grateful for the feedback, others, of course, were less enthusiastic. 
In all the recent debates about teacher evaluations, I haven't heard of anything that sounds better to me than this crude little experiment. I have some other thoughts on that subject to which I will not subject you unless asked. Most important to me, though, were not changes it might have brought about in teacher behavior or attitude, but rather what it had done for the students. The trip to LIU and the ensuing teacher valuation project, both of which were only possible in the atmosphere that prevailed in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, had helped these students find their voices. They had tasted a sense of personal and group power. They had functioned as citizens of a community with rights that demanded recognition and with thoughts of their own that demanded consideration. This aspect of the experience could be as valuable to them as any facts they might have been taught in the classroom. A new dimension of empowerment had evolved in the school that became the symbol of the community control movement. None of this was planned. I could never have predicted the direction these two projects would take. And it's been another wonderful educational opportunity for my students and for me. The environment that nurtured it, though, would soon be gasping for oxygen, strangled by the in terms of the impending strike settlement. <clears throat> by mid-November, political pressure to bring an end to the strike became irresistible. Besides the damage it had done to public education, <clears throat> and social cohesion, the economic costs were staggering. The transit authority's loss of $5 million in revenue from student bus and subway fares would soon lead to a fare increase. School bus companies lost almost as much. Suppliers of food to school lunchrooms, where children missed tens of millions of hot meals, lost $3 million. School system lost $25 billion in daily attendance state aid. <clears throat> Untold numbers of hourly workers like school bus drivers and lunchroom workers were laid off. Neighborhood candy stores, printers, five and dime stores, other small businesses suffered collateral damage. With their children home, parents missed work or scrimped to pay babysitters. Winter vacations were canceled. The total economic cost was estimated at $7.8 billion, more than the annual budget then of the entire New York state government. <clears throat> Early on Sunday, November 17th, after Ocean Hill Brownsville's representatives walked out of all night negotiations in which they had been ignored, an agreement was reached among the UFT, Supervisors Union, the Board of Regents, the Board of Education, the Superintendent, the State Commissioner, and the Mayor. Once it was ratified by the UFT Delegate Assembly, the third citywide strike would finally be over. <clears throat> that agreement was a cave-in to the UFT. It was a huge defeat for Ocean Hill, Brownsville, and the entire <laughs> community control movement. <clears throat> One, the 79 remaining UFT teachers, including stubborn 16 at 271, would not only come back, but would take over the classes that had been taught by the loyal teachers for 10 weeks. Two, McCoy and the governing board were stripped of their powers indefinitely. The district was put into receivership under the control of a state trustee with unilateral power to remove any employee, any teacher, who interfered with the returning teachers. The trustee, the UFT, and the Board of Education would all station observers in the schools, and the police were not going away. <clears throat> Three principals, including ours, plus Al Van, Les Campbell, and two other of our leading black teachers were suspended there, pending various hearings, investigations, and court rulings. Four, there would be no more open house in our schools. Admission would now be severely restricted with registration procedures for those deemed eligible to be admitted. And finally, to add insult to injury, all the striking teachers would be made whole for the salary they forfeited during all the strikes. Strikes which were, by the way, illegal. The rest of the school year was a roller coaster heading mostly downhill. <clears throat> the students rebelled against the return of the UFT 16. 
none of whom could function effectively. Classroom rebellions inevitably spilled out into the hallways. The forces of the status quo, particularly the UFT and the Board of Ed bureaucracy, later joined shamefully by the leaders of the city's Jewish community, combined forces to trigger the collapse of our program <clears throat> and to get enacted new legislation that would bang the final nails into the coffin of community control. <clears throat> After just two days, Shanker demanded that 271 be closed, and it was soon closed, and cordoned off by police for two entire weeks. The district's other schools, though, were able to continue with less interference. <clears throat> We did the best we could under increasingly difficult circumstances. All the su suspensions were eventually lifted, but way too late. There would still be some very bright spots at 271, but our best days were behind us. The golden age was over. <clears throat> As you probably know, <clears throat> the experimental districts were totally dismantled in 1970 when a new so-called decentralization law went into effect. <clears throat> James Baldwin spoke for many when he commented the exper experiment was ended not because it failed, but because it succeeded. <clears throat> Two generations later, it seems paradoxical that in the public school system of the ever-evolving, ever-changing organism of the city that is New York, so little of substance has changed. <clears throat> After numerous reorganizations, a parade of new chancellors and boards, and finally the advent of mayoral control, here we are. We had segregated inferior schools 40, 50, 60 years ago, and we have segregated inferior schools today. <clears throat> Robert Campbell, a, no relation to Les, the white guy, a journalist with a poetic bent who had spent much time in the district during its final months penned this eulogy to it. I might have a little trouble with this. He wrote, <clears throat> a sulfurous malaise envelops the city, a stifling stillness, an educational inversion that hangs in there as it always has, an inversion in which no wind blows. Yet suppose that for a time <clears throat> there had indeed been a breath of air, a small wind that breathed some life into a few ghetto schools before they were blown away. Suppose you had seen that. Suppose Rody McCoy had indeed held the keys to the kingdom. Suppose that the first real revolution in ghetto education had actually occurred. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Questions? We've got a little time. We've got some more food and drink. Any, any, anything anybody wants to ask? What's the... Uh, Differences and similarities uh, between the UFD agenda of 68 and the UFD agenda of today. Meet Wayne Barrett, <laughs> legendary investigative journalist who taught in Ocean Hill, Brownsville when I, I did and actually lived with his wife, Fran, who's in the back there <coughs> in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. I was hoping to get a chance to say that any disparaging remarks I made about the UFT, um, and I'm sure there were some, uh, <laughs> referred to the UFT of that day, not necessarily to the UFT of today. Uh, I think they, they, have, they have different battles. Uh, fighting Bloomberg is not the same as fighting Rody McCoy. Um, there's some resistance, as there always will be in a union, to weeding out the incompetence. Um, but I, th I think that, uh, and you know, I'm no expert on this, but I think that 
this UFT is making some effort to uh, find common cause with, with the parents. But the problem is <clears throat> that the split that occurred in the late 60s between the black community and the teachers union uh, became part of the collective consciousness. And, and it's still there. Um, the teachers uh, would never get the support of the black community in, in future strikes after that. Um, and I, I just think, Wayne, that uh, it's a whole different thing. They're not fighting the same battles. And I don't think you and I agree on all aspects of that. <laughs> Anybody else? But, oh, yeah. Hey, thank you so much for telling your story. Um, I, uh, before, I'm a student here at the Grad Center. Before being here, I was a student at City College of New York. And um, while uh, studying there, I also um, I spent some time looking at uh, City College's own uh, radical history of around this time, 1969. Um, and very much uh, a lot of uh, similar, uh, very community-directed, very liberatory education models uh, that uh, it seems were happening around the same time uh, with uh, students occupying buildings um, to try and open the doors of the college, uh, push forward ethnic studies, open admissions, um, students and faculty having uh, orientation that was uh, uh, relevant and reflective of the neighborhood of Harlem. And um, I wonder if, um, with the SEEK program of uh, teachers very much um, co-creating it with students um, and having a, a real considered attention towards radical education. Um, if there were any ways that uh, City College and CUNY um, people here were corresponding with Ocean Hill, Brownsville students and teachers, or if you know if any Ocean Hill, Brownsville uh, students uh, later went to CUNY and were able to impart some of that um, because it seems like these histories uh, coexisting, um, and I wonder if there was any connection that you could speak of. Well, let me not try and answer specifically. It was a, a book written by a name Vincent Harding called There is a River. And it was about the river of the fight for social justice that has cut through American history and connected everything. <clears throat> there was a river then that went through the city from Ocean Hill, Brownsville, out to the city university where the fight for open admission first began, <clears throat> out to the high schools where students organized and held their own strikes and protests. There was one three-week period <clears throat> where uh, the students organized into various different organizations, including white students, shut down 80 high schools. Um, it was a time of, I'm entitled to a voice. And uh, whether specific individuals were involved or not, sometimes they were, sometimes things arose apparently spontaneously, they were all connected. And uh, <clears throat> and this was a threat to the status quo. And it took some time to shut it all down. If I could just, Maryland, if I could just add. Go ahead. Don't forget Marilyn Gattell. Yes. Marilyn Gattell is an important connection. Specifically to your question, uh, in Brooklyn, one of the student leaders in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, ended up as a student leader of Brooklyn College okay. the following year, a, a student named Orlando Pyle, and ended up leading the struggle, one of the two leaders, of the struggle of Brooklyn College for open admissions, which paralleled the struggle at City College. I think that's, this is a rich area for um, research and investigation. And I'm teaching a seminar here this semester on this very question, linking 1968 and 69. So we're very interested in this question, the really important one. Do we have any others? Well, I would just say that the best book on Ocean Hill Brownsville prior to yours <laughs> was edited by Marilyn Gattel, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Confrontation at Ocean Hill Brownsville. And you know she was extremely close to Rody played a role in the initial Ford Foundation funding of the district and was a great intellectual of, community, of the community control movement. Yes. And was a faculty member at Queens College mm -hmm. and became a dean at Brooklyn College and ended up here before she died as a distinguished professor in political science. So that, that link, Marilyn's involvement and her papers and sort of 
the institute, she ran something called the Institute for Community Studies, and that was one of the key support groups to the, to the open admissions, uh, I'm sorry, to the, uh, the, the community control uh, movement. And th there were other things. Um, there's an institution in Brownsville now called the <clears throat> Brownsville Multi-Service Family Health Center. It's, it serves 20 or 30,000 people every year and is where people go for primary care, whether they have insurance or not. If you look at their website, on the home page, they trace their development to the struggle for community control in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. They have a community-based board. And their board chairman is <laughs> former Ocean Hill Brownsville young firebrand named Paul Chandler. Yes. I, I feel like I sort of understand the answer to this, but I I really want to know from someone who was there um, about the I think it's sixteen or so teachers right at your school and yeah. more throughout the neighborhood who wanted to come back and who didn't just sort of say like okay I'll take a transfer. I, like, it's just so interesting to me that they would come into the schools and be as disruptive as you've described them being and all this stuff. I just want to know something more <coughs> about why they wanted to be there. And my, my assumptions are that it's about territoriality and it's about not wanting, I mean, it's about maybe white people not wanting people of color to have a voice in them leaving, right? Like a lot of like pride and all these things. But I, I just want to know what you saw and what. I think it was more than that. <clears throat> started off with 350 teachers, right. including 17 at 271. <clears throat> After a few, just a couple of months, there were only 83, but still 16 at 271. They never did anything there but cause trouble. <clears throat> and I think um, that, they were, that Shanker put pressure on them and offered them rewards if they would just keep on coming back and doing what they were doing. I do know that Fred Nauman, the chapter chairman, uh, <clears throat> immediately after this, was on the UFT staff with a pretty nice, soft job. Right. Moved out of the city to Albany, right? right. I didn't even know yeah, that. Yeah, no, he, moved, he, he was sent up to Albany. He wasn't even in the city anymore. He was on the UFT staff up there. Oh, the lobbying? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, thought about that a lot also. But none of them came back to teach, that's for sure. Yes? I was just wondering um, if you could speak about what do you think was going through someone like Shanker? And let's say you threw out Shanker, as in Shanker's not part of the picture. You have a UFT that is resisting the community control experiment. Um, even though it had somewhat supported it perhaps earlier, it was opposed to it in this, in this, in this case. Why, what's their rationale, you think? Like, well, why is there, and then why is it so that Shanker and, you know, like you um, suggest, like, he doesn't have total support for the kind of maneuvers that he does with the anti-Semitism and all that, but like, how is it, like, what's, what's pushing them as much as it is? And then why, it seems like it's a life and death situation for them. When they pull out all the stops, um, was it a life and death situation for them? Or, you know? Well, <clears throat> it didn't have to be. Uh, they turned against it when they found out that it was for real. They thought... <clears throat> First, they thought the governing board would never try to really assert control of the district. <clears throat> Secondly, they thought, since it was an experimental district, the Board of Education would put the union's pet program in there. It was called More Effective Schools. And who could be against more effective schools? <clears throat> Basically, it, it was a feather bedding program, which just put more staff, more union teachers in the schools. <clears throat> in the places that it was uh, tried, um, parents weren't impressed by it. They said the teachers were just doing the same things but with smaller classes, and it was just easier work for the teachers. And there were evaluations done that showed that it was not effective. 
But the union wanted that. That was a lot of jobs and a lot of easier work for the people who were there. Um, they objected to the principals. They objected to McCoy. But mainly, <laughs> the, the UFT agenda was to prevent any meaningful decentralization from taking place. Because that could mean the union would be decentralized and not as powerful. <clears throat> they liked things the way they were. Um, they, had, they had no problems, no existential problems with management like most unions do. Uh, they were all the same. They were the same people. Uh, teachers would uh, you know, take the exams, um, being coached by other teachers, and they'd get their promotions, and then they'd coach other teachers. This is all one big happy white family. Out. But the UFT was also a young union um, at the time with uh, very little history of, of manipulating anything. And the union <coughs> that represented the teachers had been wiped out in the anti communist movements in the 50s. And, um, the year before, the union's first effort was around the career guidance program. I don't know if anybody remembers, but teachers were complaining that. They, they couldn't teach because there were one or two kids in every class that were disrupting. So if they could just get rid of those one or two kids, that was a then teacher. they would do it. And that was the first program in the union's history where they had involved themselves in curriculum and, and internal stuff. And what happened was is that 90% of the kids in the career guidance classes were black boys. So it really set a stage because the, the more radicalized and more conscious black community was looking at that even before the decentral, the community control stuff took off. And um, Shanker and them were building power, and they found themselves in the middle of a maelstrom that gave them a spot in unions that have continued for the last 30 or 40 years. <coughs> and that was, but they were, they were powerless before, essentially before Ocean Hill Brownsville or before the community control stuff. Well, they, they certainly, yeah, they put all their chips on it and they won. And they ended up. It, the decentralization law set up so-called community school boards around the city that the UFT ended up controlling. Hey Charlie, can you tell us what happened to you after that? Because you didn't disappear as a... Straight downhill. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. You ended up doing some really important stuff. Well, after that, uh, I came back after the district was dissolved. Um, and it was so different. It was a UFT school. Um, it was quiet. For the first time, we were fully staffed. It was easy. The students knew me. They knew I was different from the others. Um, and I was asked to be the math department chairman because I was the only one in the department who knew anything about math. Uh, but I knew this wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to work for me. And my days would be numbered anywhere. So. Helen Berenbaum, sitting in the back there, offered me a job at the City University, and I took it. Um, then <clears throat> later I went on to uh, Staten Island Community College, where I was hired as a community organizer, basically. And uh, it took four years to get myself fired from there. <laughs> and uh, during that time, Alan and I uh, were uh, in an organization called People Against Racism in Education. That was a citywide group that did advocacy and curriculum and teacher training and stuff. Uh, but after uh, I got fired from CUNY, I was out of education. I couldn't, couldn't find another job. Dr. Abrams. A historian looks to the past from the context of where we are today. But I have to ask you if you contemplate the future for us, too, given what you told me. One of the interesting parts of your story is the importance of gifted teachers. Your giftedness was further enhanced by a sense of joining together for something of great value. But without that inherent giftedness, you could not have succeeded. Passion alone couldn't do it. You had, to, you had to teach the way you could teach, and only a gifted teacher can teach. Now, in the present, we have a vast 
serious decline in union movement. It's really on the way down. A massive decline in funding education. Perhaps you'd also comment about um, charter schools and their influence. And in the face of a decline in education as a value, in learning as a value, in unions as a value, where do you see the fight going now? Where do you see the center of action? What can we do to revitalize children, their education, and their future, given this state of affairs? Well, that's a simple question. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I don't have an answer. All I know is it's going in the wrong direction. The, um, <clears throat> there was an article in the Times yesterday about Memphis. Did anybody see that? Mm -hmm. The state took over the lowest performing schools in Tennessee, most of which are in Memphis. They were all black schools. They outsourced those schools mostly to charter school operators <clears throat> who fired the entire staff, nearly all of whom were black and brought in new idealistic people from Teach for America and, o and other places who were nearly all white, <coughs> and polished everything up and began a whole new program based on standardized tests. At first, um, there was, there was a, a, a spark. There was a jump in achievement based on the tests which, by the way, have nothing to do with education. Um, and then it started to decline. The parents hate this. The parents of kids in schools that are now nice and clean and have all these bright young people in there, uh, they, it looked like nearly unanimously opposed. They say the teachers don't understand our culture. They, they're too strict. They're making the kids sit at their desk like this and not letting them go to the bathroom. Uh, this isn't it. We used to complain, you remember this, that the schools were operating on a factory model, that that's what the eight periods were about, an assembly line, that, that kids were being programmed to fit into industrial society. Now, <clears throat> We have a hedge fund model, right? Endless crunching of numbers with no regard for the human dimension. And when the unions fight that, I think they're right. Yeah, I agree with you about the commodity. The children are now commodities. Schools are now commodities. They're no longer people. They're no longer dedicated to education. They're commodities to produce income for somebody. That's what they're there for. And the climate of violence and bullying, which characterizes our culture, feeds into those systems. But I, I feel terrible about the collapse of union and the collapse of educational standards and educational funding, because there was a marriage that could have gone someplace. And the, the pity of this story, the tragedy of this story, is they fought each other instead of working together. That's the tragedy. But the highlight of the story is gifted teachers can make, gifted teachers can make a difference in any climate. I suppose you're right. But um, I, I'm not sure what a gifted teacher is. I know what you a gifted teacher does. You would have heard what a gifted teacher is. Well, you know, <clears throat> we have these teacher evaluations that everybody's arguing about. Let me take a minute on that. Um, and, and the arguments about the role of the standardized tests. I gave a little story about teacher evaluations. And teachers who listened to what their students said. Uh, could improve. You, you don't have to come in knowing everything. Um, you can figure it out along the way. You can get help. And if you're involved with the community, it's easier. I think, here's my teacher evaluation, aside from the student evaluation. 
we put a parent and maybe a supervisor in the classroom and have them rate the teachers on a one to 10 scale on six things, energy, enthusiasm, level of expectations, knowledge of the subject matter, ability to communicate in an age appropriate way. And finally, and this is the thing that was so absent <coughs> among that UFT cohort, respect, respect for the students, respect for their families, respect for their communities and their cultures. Because if you don't have that, you're against the children and they will know it right away. Uh, I don't have a solution to <laughs> Maybe a couple more, and then we can sort of... Okay. But, but before, before that, I want to introduce one of my star eighth grade students and the valedictory, valedictorian of the 1969 class, Monifa Edwards. Okay, somebody had a hand up. Yeah. Yes, um, thanks for coming out today, Charlie. Um, what I, want to, what I want to ask is how, like, at the, after the conflict was so-called over, how was the morality <coughs> of the community as far as the relationship between the parents, the students, and the UFT staff that um, was present in the building? Like, how did the community, um, what was the ills or what was the effects of the community outside of the school um, as, you, as you traveled to school? Did you stay there a year after the... Um, yeah. So what did you feel when you went to school every morning? How did you feel? Because I'm pretty sure the community, when y'all walked out, you, you explained one, one trip that y'all walked outside mm -hmm. and community members just started jumping into the line. So I would, I would assume that the community was, um, was riled up when all this was going on. Yeah. So but, but, how, how, how did it look after the strike was over? Were, were, were people beaten? Were people still, how did it People look? could still mobilize, but they were exhausted. I and mean, this was this took an amazing amount of, of energy and time and sacrifice. Um, and it, we limped along. But after 1970, when, <coughs> when these demonstration distri districts were closed down, so did the parent movement. It just, it just was wiped out um, and has never come back. What, what's interesting is that in 2013, um, the same sets of conditions that still affect Brownsville and Bed-Stuy affect populations of uh, poor and working class and immigrant kids in almost every big modern city in the, in the world. Yeah. And so the particularity of the black experience in Bedford-Stuy and the, the black liberation movement in the 60s is a particular historical moment. There's something that's changed through globalization and through what the agendas for working people are that the schools and the public and, and the public conversation really hasn't caught up to, I think. So I think the answer to your question is, is that the conversation that we need to have isn't being had in public in the United States anywhere at the moment. Um, and that's, you know, that's, I think that's the struggle is to open up the conversation about how do we want, what do we want to do with the next generation of young people? What, what America are we raising them and training and, and bringing our kids up? Well, largely, largely uh, training to be incarcerated. Yeah, but yeah, that's not the answer, Charlie. See, I, I think some of us got re-energized around the Occupy Wall Street movement, you know, and we got the message that the systems are really corrupted. And there are a lot of good people running the Board of Ed right now. I, I've been around for 40 years. And I've never seen a better group, a nicer group of people. I like Dennis Walcott. He's a terrific guy, and I like a lot of the people there. They're, they're helpless. Stupid is perpetuating itself. And I think what, what's happened is that we're waiting for something to happen at the ground level that says, we don't want to be Donald Trump. We don't want this. We've got to reroute America toward a, a more sustainable <laughs> world where people cooperate. And, and that's the conversation that needs to be had. In one of the um, founding documents of the co community control movement, <clears throat> its intellectual godfather, Preston Wilcox, wrote that we can have schools that build on what's good in our communities, in our cultures, instead of being opposed <coughs> to them. All I know is that since 1970, the city and all cities have tried everything. 
They've tried this, this phony decentralization, tried mayoral control. They've spot, uh, tried the data-driven model. Nothing has worked. So maybe it would be worth taking a chance and going back to something that seemed to be working before it got shut down, uh, whatever the consequences. And maybe it would work. Let the, let the biggest stakeholders in the schools, the parents and the children, have a little bit of say. This is like a great place to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.